Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. I am your host, Mike DiGirolamo, bringing you the news and inspiration from nature's front line. Today's guest is someone we've had on the show before. He's a very experienced environmental journalist whose words have appeared in the Washington Post, National Geographic, The Atlantic, Hakai, and others. He's also the author of the critically hailed Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter. He returns to the podcast once again to detail another book, his latest, Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet. I'm speaking, of course, of environmental reporter Ben Goldfarb. His volume details the shockingly detrimental impacts of road systems on animals and our natural world, and even ourselves. It also shares the concepts and practices of road ecology, which implements solutions to road infrastructure to reduce that impact. In the United States alone, roughly a million animals are killed on the road each day, which Ben notes is probably an underestimate. We talk about this grisly problem, which is definitely not exclusive to the United States, and is projected to only worsen with nations across the globe rapidly developing their own road networks. However, some countries are taking a different approach and incorporating more road ecology in their designs. Ben details some of those notable examples here, which offers engineers and planners proof of concept in how wildlife can be taken into consideration in the development of roads and correcting the detrimental impacts of already existing ones. Ben also touches upon how cities and people themselves have been impacted with the rapid development of highways in the United States, creating and perpetuating social injustices that the country still deals with today, and how some communities are working to undo that damage. First of all, thank you for uh, joining me today. Ben, welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast, and how are you? Uh, I'm doing great, Mike. Thanks a lot for having me, and I'm excited to talk with you. And I'm excited to talk about your book, too. This was a really awesome read. There's so much we could talk about, but I want to just like, the first thing I want to do is just sort of set the stage here. So you talk about the fact that 1 million animals, 1 million a day are getting killed on roads. Like that's just in the United States. That is a really, you know, sobering statistic and more per week are being killed in the United States than in the deep water horizon oil spill, all from roads. So how, how did we get here? How did we get to this spot? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a great, it's a great question. I, I guess I'd, I'd also add that that, you know, that 1 million road killed animals a day uh, estimate is really probably an underestimate, if, if anything, you know, that that's a very commonly st- cited figure that comes from some uh, citizen science surveys that the Humane Society conducted back in the 1960s. So that was a, a very rough estimate and a, a really dated one. And, you know, if, if anything, the, the number is, is probably quite a bit higher. Uh, you know, as, as for how we got there, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, more than a century of car culture, I, I guess, is the, is the answer. You know, we have uh, 4 million miles of road uh, in the United States alone. You know, 40 million miles of road kind of spider web our, our planet. And, you know, I think this has kind of historically been a, a, an, under, an underrated or an underappreciated conservation crisis in a, a, a lot of ways. You know, I think that for, you know, for a very long time, the lay public and conservation groups and media were you know, very focused on, you know, certainly things like deforestation, poaching, uh, climate change, obviously all very worthy conservation crises that demand our that demand our attention. But you know, I think that because roads are so ubiquitous and part of our daily lives, you know, we tend not to notice them. They're kind of invisible to us. You know, we drive on them all the time and don't really think a whole lot about them. And and uh, you know, fortunately, in the last decade or two, you know, I think that roads have started to get their due as a, a true uh, conservation catastrophe. Right. You you actually point out in the book that there's been shockingly little study done on them. Like, I think what you said in the book is that one of the first studies like on the, the impact of them on ecology was in 2017. Is that right? Well, I mean, it's, it's interesting to go back through the, you know, the, the annals of road ecology, um, you know, even though the the term, the term itself was not coined in English until the 1990s by uh, an ecologist named Richard Foreman. But, you know, in a a sense, the discipline goes back a hundred years, you know, in, in the 1920s, as cars kind of proliferated in the United States, you know, all of these biologists, you know, began to basically count dead animals on their road trips. You know, there are all of these researchers driving around places like Iowa and Illinois and and noticing, hey, there are a lot of 
dead garter snakes and woodpeckers and, uh, you know, ground squirrels, all of these different animals are, are getting crushed. And there was actually quite a lot of hand wringing uh, at the time. You know, it's, it's uh, interesting to sort of go back and, and think about the early history of the car. You know, when the car first appeared in American cities, everybody was totally freaked out about its toll on human pedestrians. You know, it was this kind of fearsome new technology. Nobody knew how to drive. There were no safety features. You know, people were being killed all over the place. And there were all of these big kind of safety demonstrations done in cities like Milwaukee and Pittsburgh and New York. So there's quite a lot of sort of societal angst about uh, about cars and, and that sort of trickled down into wildlife as well. So all of these biologists were sort of worried about cars as a source of, uh, as, of mortality. And then, you know, over, over time, uh, you know, cars kind of became normalized. You know, we stopped having these safety parades in, in cities and just sort of accepted, uh, you know, 40,000 dead Americans a year as the, you know, inevitable toll of progress and, you know, a, a million or more dead animals per day is the, the toll of progress. So, you know, the discipline does kind of go away for, for a while. And, uh, you know, it's only within the last couple of decades that it's, you know, it's really been fully, fully revived, I would say. Right. You know, there's a, there's a section in your book where you, you go into how the setup of highways has really fractured cities and, and perpetuated a lot of social injustice. And that's definitely something I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to want to talk about a little bit later on. Something I found interesting at, at one point in American history, um, that like the term jaywalking was sort of like coined um, as a way to sort of put down or insult pedestrians and put the onus on them to be to be safe around cars rather than cars being safe around humans. And I just thought that was like really indicative of the way that things were moving. But as many roads as there already are, there's going to be about 25 million more miles of roads worldwide by 2050. It's, it's kind of just an insane amount of roads. Um, and it's hard for me to sort of like conceptualize what that looks like. Uh, can you kind of paint a picture for our listeners about what kind of scale of increase of roads we're looking at? Yeah, you know, it's it's a kind of a phenomenon that uh, the the ecologist Bill Lawrence, who I think has written for Manga Bay or certainly you know been featured in, in Manga Bay, yeah. has described as you know the the infrastructure tsunami, this explosion of new not only roads but rail lines and power lines and fiber optic cables and shipping ports, you know, all of this new infrastructure that's headed for the developing world. You know, I mean. Countries like Kenya and Nepal and and India and Bangladesh are you know really already at the kind of the forefront of of, uh, of these transformations and, and you know it's I mean this is obviously something that you know that Manga Bay covers all the time is you know the, the impact of all of this new infrastructure and you know it's it's a, a challenging. Uh, situation to think about, you know, and, 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 uh, you know, talk to Bill about this and he's, you know, he's written quite a, a, a great deal about this that, you know, look from a, a kind of a human well-being and livelihood standpoint, you know, a lot of this development is, is, you know, potentially desirable. And certainly a lot of it is inevitable. You know, I mean, we, we use roads to, you know, bring crops to market and, you know, send kids to school and, you know, connect people with hospitals and, you know, all of the, all of the services that, you know, we kind of take for granted. Um, and, you know, having new sort of infrastructure for that human connectivity, you know, is, is there's, there's a, a quite a great deal of societal benefit to that. But, you know, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of that infrastructure is slated to go through, you know, some of the last intact habitats on earth, especially in, in tropical countries. And, you know, so much of the charismatic megafauna that, you know, that we, uh, we care so much about elephants, tigers, gorillas, you know, you name it is existential, existentially threatened, I think, by, you know, by the infrastructure tsunami. And, you know, and that's one of the things that road ecology can kind of point us toward is, you know, is, is how potentially, to guide some of that inevitable development in, in, you know, ways that are less catastrophic. You know, maybe that means uh, avoiding certain intact habitats, of course, you know, maybe it, maybe it means, I mean, you know, certainly you have to, you know, I mean, this bill, as Bill would say, you know, you have to fight the most catastrophic roads, but, you know, some of the, some of the roads that are, 
you know, going to happen, whether you like them or not, you know, can be rerouted potentially around, you know, those men- those most sensitive habitats, or they can be built in ways that accommodate wildlife through, you know, wildlife crossing structures and other other uh, means. So, you know, that's that's kind of the, the situation is that, you know, we're due for uh, a whole lot of new infrastructure. Some of it is, you know, certainly inevitable. And, you know, that 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 might be our task is to, you know, make it uh, as least catastrophic as possible. Right. We're gonna get. We're definitely gonna touch upon um, some of those, and you cover you cover a lot of them in the book. Obviously, uh, there was a quote though at the beginning of the book that I I wanted to like bring up and see if you could shed some light on for our listeners, um, if if you don't mind me mentioning. It's from Charles Brown. It says, um, "Once the environment is ruined, all we have left is rats, cockroaches, and cliff swallows." Um, so why did he say that? Um, what is that? Can you just tell our listeners what that means? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's a great quote. I love, I love that quote and I'm glad you, you picked up on it too. Uh, so, so Charles Brown is a, he's a, an ornithologist and, you know, he's basically spent his career studying cliff swallows and, you know, cliff swallows as many listeners probably know, or, you know, they're pretty, human adapted urban animals, you know, they build those little mud nests that, you know, you often see on the underside of uh, highway overpasses and bridges and, you know, sometimes plastered onto the sides of buildings, right? We've actually created a lot of habitat for for cliff swallows you know they're they're uh, you know they're kind of a, a pretty successful species in the anthropocene as, as charles's quote was uh alluding to and you know the way they've been so successful uh is essentially by evolving uh to accommodate uh roads and and traffic you know all of these cliff swallows living under highway bridges and overpasses obviously get hit by cars. And, you know, what what Charles Brown found over time is that the population is actually evolving to become less susceptible to roadkill. Specifically, their wings are getting shorter. And you can kind of imagine that, you know, if you're a bird, having long wings is good for flying long distances and straight lines. And having short wings is good for making lots of tight rolls and turns that you might use to avoid, you know, an 18-wheeler barreling down the down the highway. Um, so, you know, what, what Charles Brown found is that, is that that is in fact happening, that birds, you know, these cliff swallows are, are developing uh, shorter wings over time. It's a, kind of a very clear cut, neat case of, of natural selection. And it's, you know, kind of an amazing testament, I think, to how deeply embedded uh, roads are in nature, that they're, you know, literally influencing evolution uh, at an incredibly rapid time scale. You know, in a matter of decades, these birds have substantially changed. So um, it's something else that really kind of shocked me um, in that I wasn't expecting to find out when I when I picked up this book was that um, the National Park Service actually has one of the most extensive road networks in the world. You point this out. Um, and so when we're talking about roads, we're not just talking about highways, but we're talking about like the roads and national parks. Can you just sort of tell our listeners like what we're looking at when we're looking at roads that encroach on national parks? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting to think about the history of national parks as being, you know, kind of automotive spaces in a lot of ways, you know, when when the parks were being created, you know, the Park Service, this brand new agency that's, you know, more than a century old now, uh, you know, had to get people to it's, you know, all of these park units, you know, like like Olympic and Rainier and, you know, and Yellowstone, of course, and Yosemite. Uh, and, you know, cars were the way to get them there. Um, you know, and that was sort of the agency's task. You know, it was this, you know, in the early 1900s, it's, it's this brand new federal agency. And, you know, it's trying to secure funding from Congress. And, you know, the way to do that is to build a, a constituency of tourists, basically. And, you know, so as a result, the Park Service, you know, in the 1920s and 30s built this, you know, it's kind of this massive road infrastructure to allow people to enter the parks and you know and and I mean, certainly, you know, that was a very successful model, right? I mean, think about all of the people who have been able to experience Glacier and, you know, in right. Yellowstone and all of our, you know, our country's in kind of incredible natural wonders. You know, there's no question that that road network that the Park Service created was incredibly effective in in developing a, a constituency of people who treasure and value nature. Uh, but, you know, in the in the process, obviously, those roads did a, a lot of damage to to that very same nature. You know, obviously, lots of animals are, are killed in national parks by roads. You know, you can sort of it's kind of crazy to think that, you know, in a national park, you know, in, place, in a place like Yellowstone, you know, an elk is safe from hunting and development and basically every other pressure, but they're still susceptible to cars. Uh, you know, that's kind of the only the only 
ecological threat that's permitted in, in these places. And, you know, road noise is a big issue in national parks as well. You know, all of those kind of winding scenic roads up on mountainsides, you know, broadcast a lot of noise pollution in, into, into the environment. And, you know, it's been shown very clearly that noise pollution is a really significant form of habitat loss that's effectively driving wild animals away from places they'd otherwise like to live. So that's kind of the irony of the, of the national parks is that they're, you know, they're, they're places that uh, have helped people love nature through roads and automobiles, even as those roads and cars have, have done a lot of damage to nature. And the inverse of that, like undoing, trying to undo some of that damage, like in the 90s, there was that you point out in the book that they passed that roadless rule. Also, a lot of roads became either decommissioned or or abandoned. But the impact doesn't stop there, right? Like you actually point out what happens to mountainsides or hillsides when a road just sits left abandoned. And that, that those kind of environmental impacts, they really were, to me, they were really surprising. Can you sort of like detail to our listeners what some of those were? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in addition to the National Park Service, you know, there's there's such a gigantic federal land management a agency in, in the U.S., you know, the, the, the national, the, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, you know, which manages our, our national forests. And, you know, and, and the Forest Service has close to 400,000 miles of roads. And, you know, many of them are these old dirt logging roads that were, you know, cut in the, the middle of the 20th century and have since been abandoned. And, you know, you'd sort of think that an abandoned road would be ecologically benign, right? It's not, you know, there's no traffic on it. There's, you know, or not much traffic, you know, there's not a whole lot of noise or roadkill. Um, but, you know, those those old dirt roads, as you as you mentioned, you know, still have a really severe impact. You know, they're, they're really enormous sources of erosion and all of that, all of that sort of that dirt that was shoved aside by, you know, bulldozers and excavators, you know, decades ago is still just kind of like lying there in most cases. And, you know, there have been a number of, you know, really prominent cases, um, you know, especially in, in Idaho in the mid 1990s, where, you know, these big rainstorms triggered these kind of catastrophic landslides that were all connected to these, you know, these old derelict roads that had never been treated. And, you know, all of those landslides just dump, uh, you know, sediment and boulders and debris into streams and, you know, in, in some cases have really smothered, uh, you know, it's a very, very sensitive uh, salmon and trout spawning grounds and, you know, have done a lot of damage. So, you know, I think that what, what that, that forest service road network shows is that, you know, roads aren't just, they're not just bad because of the traffic they host, you know, they're also bad because, you know, they are, they, I mean, they themselves are physically transformative to nature and, and, uh, you know, can do a lot of damage even when uh, not a whole lot of cars drive along them. Yeah, I, that I just found that's pretty shocking. We don't need to like you know belabor the negative here, obviously, because you you highlight like the amazing things that road ecologists are doing here. We'll start with one which you sort of point out in in the book is is arguably one of the most famous. It's the Trans Canada Highway near Banff National Park. Serendipitously, I actually had the privilege of visiting this exact road system last year with my so partner. Cool. It was really really cool. I actually ran alongside it. And there's this gigantic fence that that basically cordons off the wildlife from from going onto the road, right? And then there's also wildlife crossings. As I was finishing up my conversation with Ben, we discussed more about what this looks like in person up close, and I realized I probably should include that snippet here. I'm so cool that you had that uh, experience of running along the Trans Canada. That, that sounds like yeah, an awesome. Trip. I had no idea. I had no idea what it was when I saw it. I was like, "What, what is this?" And someone was like, "That's to keep out grizzly bears." They're like, they're in here with us. And I was just like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how this run's going to go today. Right. Uh, oh, oh, you, oh, you were on the inside of the fence. Oh, cool. yeah, yeah. So when you run it, you run on the inside because yeah. you have to, you have to open up. I probably should include this somewhere in there, but you have to open up a fence. You walk through it. It's like a big, like iron gate. And then you close it behind you. And that's supposed to sort of like, you know, keep the sections. Yeah. You, you walk along it. Um, and, and you, you open various sections with this, with the giant gate. Oh, so cool. Huh? But go ahead and tell, tell our listeners what this road is like and why it's just so famous. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, those those Banff wildlife crossings probably are the most famous wildlife crossings uh, in in the world, in part because they're in this you know really popular uh, protected area that gets a gets a lot of a lot of visitors. And you know, they they've been incredibly influential. You know, the story there was basically, you know, at, at some point, uh, you know, in the in the 1970s, uh, you know, the uh, Parks Canada basically planned to expand that that highway, you know, which goes through the Trans Canada Highway, which goes through Banff National Park, um, you know, which would have been, uh, you know, certainly deleterious to wildlife. You know, I mean, that road was already killing lots of elk and deer and other other animals. So, you know, so Parks Canada, as they sort of expanded the highway, also included all of these new wildlife crossings. Uh, you know, and this is sort of in the 1980s by now. Uh, you know, a bunch of sort of underpasses at that time, primarily to allow elk and other animals to, to move beneath the highway paired with those fences you mentioned that, you know, kind of guide them to those crossings. And, you know, and that was, that was really effective and successful, but, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, biologists noticed or at least suspected was that, you know, those underpasses weren't being used a whole lot by grizzly bears and other other large carnivores in the in the park, but especially bears, uh, and that you know they needed different structures to kind of uh, you know help help bears in particular get get across the highway. So they actually added uh, in the mid 1990s, you know, a, a couple of big overpasses as well, and you know those are really like the iconic structures that everybody sees, right? The underpasses are kind of inconspicuous, but the overpasses are, are really visible. And, and now I think there I think there are six overpasses or, or so uh, in in Banff along the Trans-Canada Highway. And, you know, they've been incredibly successful. One of the, the really important things they've shown uh, is that, you know, grizzly bears not only use them, they actually mate on both sides of them, right? So that's really important because, you know, if you had, if you had animals that crossed a highway but didn't successfully reproduce on the other side, you know, that population would still be genetically fragmented by the road and would, you know, would be at risk of sort of long-term inbreeding potentially and decline. So you really need, you know, both males and females moving across the highway, using those structures, breeding on either side. And that's what they've shown in Banff is that not only do, you know, does that, does that happen, then, you know, the females, the sows teach their cubs how to cross. Uh, and then those cubs become crossers themselves. So it's kind of this cool intergenerational network of, of, uh, of crossings that have been facilitated by these, these really cool structures that are built, that were built in Banff and have since inspired you know, so many crossings around the world. I mean, it's it's fun to talk to road ecologists because every single one of them has visited Banff at some point. You know, it's it's uh, it, it really yeah. is the most influential project out there. Uh, something really important important to point out here, though, is that the the success though it wasn't immediate. Like it took it took some right. time for uh, for the animals to to see it and adapt to it, like like decades, right? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe not decades, but certainly years. Yeah, it definitely was not immediate, especially for those bears. You know, bears are they're obviously they're very intelligent. They're kind of wary. You know, they really avoid roads. Um, you know, they just they just uh, hate they tend to hate highways. So, they you know, they did at first not really use these structures. And, you know, I think I think that, uh, you know, in the, the early years of those overpasses in particular, you know, there, there were some naysayers out there who basically said, hey, these things are just, you know, multi-million dollar failures. But, you know, in reality, the animals were just acclimating to the structures and learning how to use them. And, you know, within within a, a few years, you know, crossings really started to increase. And, you know, again, now you have these animals that have kind of learned to use them over time and taught you know their own kin, and and uh, it's a it's a, a pretty a pretty amazing story of how you know the knowledge of where these structures are and how to use them gets transmitted across generations over time. And, and so another really famous example that where where you you, you went and visited was um, that we've actually covered here at Manga Bay is U.S. Highway ninety three, right. um, which the Salish and Kootenai tribes provided their ingenuity on. Um, and there's, I believe, 42 of these crossings, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, yeah, yeah Manga Bay, has, has, you, got, you guys did a fantastic video about this, this very project. And, you know, I mean, for me, that was really my sort of the, the origins of my interest in this topic. You know, it was a, a decade ago, I got to go up on to a wildlife overpass that, it, that was built on the, on the Flathead Reservation, um, you know, kind of in partnership between the, the tribes and, and uh, the Montana Department of Transportation. And, uh, you know, it's, it was just an incredibly inspiring thing to see. You know, here's this, uh, you know, amazing sort of expression of ecological empathy. You know, we do so much on this planet to make animals' lives harder, often with our infrastructure 
structure. And, you know, here was, here was a structure we had built to make their lives better and safer and easier and, and you know, contribute to conservation. I, I just found that really inspiring. And that's, you know, that's, that is an incredibly successful and influential project. As you say, you know, there are around 40 crossings, you know, everything from that big overpass to, you know, little culverts that get used by, you know, turtles and, and meadow voles. So it's really, you know, a whole gamut of crossings designed to help the entire ecosystem safely navigate that highway. So something else you bring up in the book that I thought was really interesting to talk about was this idea of malicious restoration, um, where I think I think some engineers or ecologists said that where wildlife crossings can sometimes, or at least they fear, they can become like a form of greenwashing infrastructure. Can you, can you talk about this a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's, it is an interesting concept. It, you know, basically the idea is that, you know, it's, you could, you could imagine a scenario where wildlife crossings were used to justify the the construction of an ecologically harmful road. You know, right. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna punch this road, you know, right through the middle of of the Amazon. But you know, we're gonna put in a few underpasses and overpasses, and and then it'll be fine. Um, and you know, I'm I'm not sure that this is actually happening, but you know, certainly it's a, it's a, a justifiable concern that you know that some ecologists have have raised in in uh, in, in various papers. Uh, and you know, I, th I think that I think that it does get to a really important point, which is that look, wildlife crossings are great projects. They're, they they work really well. You know, they pay for themselves by preventing you know dangerous collisions with large animals, right? So they're you know they're they're great, but they only solve some of the problems that the road creates, you know, they, they help solve that, uh, you know, that roadkill problem, of course. Uh, and, you know, they help uh, sort of permit animal movements and migrations to continue, but they don't, they don't solve road noise. You know, they don't solve uh, the tire particles that, you know, are spewing off of our vehicles and, you know, killing salmon in, in uh, Western Washington. You know, they don't prevent us from dumping huge quantities of salt uh, on roads and transforming freshwater ecosystems. You know, they, and they don't change or they don't prevent all of the land use change that comes with the road, right? I mean, the, you know, roads facilitate, you know, burning and, and deforestation and clearing for, you know, cow pastures or, you know, or soy or soybean fields in, in, uh, you know, in, in Brazil. Uh, and, you know, and, and wildlife crossings don't do anything about any of those problems, obviously. So, you know, certainly, Wildlife crossings are are beneficial, but you know I, I think it's I think it's true that you know they they shouldn't be used to justify uh, you know the creation of a road that is going to do many other forms of ecological damage. So um, I want to talk about when you visited Brazil because this is a really interesting point that you made in the book is that unlike the United States in Brazil even though they're, they're expanding roads rapidly and, and there's a lot of them, there appears to be more people working on studying the impact on wildlife there, like per road or per project than even here in the U S can you, can you talk about that more? Yeah. I, you know, I think, I think you're, I think you're right about that, that there is, you know, kind of this, uh, large and growing road ecology movement in Brazil. I mean, of course, it's the most biodiverse country in the in the world by by many measures. Uh, and you know, there's a kind of a, a resultant interest in in conserving you know all of the the spectacular fauna they have there, um, which is being tested right now by you know this wave of new infrastructure that's that's being built in Brazil. You know, many uh, you know there are new highways being built, and you know just as um, you know, harmful in some instances, or, you know, there are existing dirt highways that are being paved, uh, you know, encouraging a, a lot, a lot more traffic. Uh, and, you know, certainly that's a, that's a, a, a huge concern. And, you know, there are lots of road ecologists in Brazil who are, you know, kind of addressing uh, these sorts of issues. And, you know, I, I mean, when I was down there, I, you know, I found that in some ways, you know, they're, they're much more progressive about, you know, the, about accounting for the impacts of roads than, you know, than we are uh, here in the U.S. I mean, a couple of examples, you know, one, one state park that I, I visited in, in Brazil, you know, they'd actually re-engineered the road through the, through the park so that you couldn't drive fast. They'd made the road intentionally sinuous and kind of wavy on the, on, you know, both the X and the Y axis right. to slow down vehicle speeds. And, you know, I was like, that's a, I mean, that's a pretty radical, and they'd also closed it at night too. I mean, you know, so few, I mean, there, I, you know, the number of roads in North America that are closed at night, you know, you could count on one hand if, you know, if, if there are any at all. Um, so, you know, in, in some ways, the management of that road was much more 
thoughtful and progressive and radical than you know any, anything we've done in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of really interesting when you pointed out in the book there was like a there was an engineer who was sort of marveling at at what they were doing in India, where they like just simply raise the highway like to to keep cars from slamming into tigers, and they were in just impressed by like the the fortitude and the ingenuity and they were like saying like something like that in the u.s like you ju- you can't just do that in the u.s like whereas in india they just they just get it done um and i thought that was really a really interesting uh difference in how things are considered yeah you know i think i think that also speaks to you know the different places that different countries are, you know, on kind of the development curve, right? I mean, here in the U.S., you know, our our, our infrastructure, I and mean, especially our big highways, is basically built, right? It, you know, now we do, we do we are, we're mostly maintaining existing infrastructure rather than, you know, building a whole lot of new uh, infrastructure, especially when it comes to, you know, like those giant interstate highways that, that cover our, our country. So there's not really much we can do about them, right? I mean, certainly we can retrofit them, you know, we can add wildlife crossings, but, you know, they're, they're basically fixed in place. Whereas, you know, a lot of countries uh, elsewhere in the world, like India, are, you know, they're building new infrastructure from scratch. And, you know, that allows them to do it right the first time. And, you know, and certainly that's not always happening, unfortunately. But in some cases, it is like that tiger sanctuary you mentioned, where they, you know, elevated the entire highway on concrete pillars so that, uh, you know, animals could move back and forth under under the roadway. You know, again, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, a cooler bit of design than, you know, basically anything that, that we have. And, and, uh, you know, I think something that, uh, you know, we could, we could learn a lot from. Um, I have to talk about this, this section of the book where you, where you visit Tasmania, which is colloquially dubbed the roadkill capital of the world. Why is it called the roadkill capital of the world? Yeah, Tasmania has, you know, some of the the highest rates of roadkill ever documented. And, you know, it's I think that's probably due to a kind of a confluence of factors. You know, they they have, I mean, first they have lots of wildlife. Uh, you know, they have lots of, you know, wombats and wallabies and patamelons, you know, just kind of and possums, this kind of incredible diversity of marsupials uh that that lives there. And they also have lots of, you know, kind of winding roads that, you know, go through the bush and don't really have shoulders. So, you know, I think it's a kind of a, a combination of abundant wildlife and, uh, you know, and, and roadkill conducive uh, infrastructure. Uh, and, you know, kind of the, the amazing thing that uh, I found in Tasmania that, you know, that chapter of the book is really about is just the incredible culture of roadkill concern and compassion that exists in, in Tasmania, uh, you know, because, you know, and, and in part, that's that's really the the result of of you know of, of the unique biology of marsupials, right? You know, marsupials, of course, carry their joeys, their babies, in pouches, and oftentimes, uh, you know, a female marsupial will be killed by a car, and the joey will actually survive in in the in the pouch un, unharmed. You know, that happens with again, you know, wombats and and wallabies in, in particular, and you know, there's this kind of incredible community of people uh, in, in Tasmania who go around checking the pouches of, of, uh, of dead animals and then hand raising the, the babies that they find. And that's an incredible commitment. You know, it, it, it could take two years to raise a baby wombat to adulthood. You know, that's two years of bottle feeding and, you know, and medicine dispensing and butt wiping, uh, you know, and without basically without a, without a vacation. Um, but, you know, there are hundreds of Tasmanians doing, doing just that. And, you know, I found that to be incredibly admirable. You know, roadkill is something that, uh, you know, we tend to ignore or, or look away from or, you know, hide from. Um, whereas, you know, there they've, they've really, uh, I don't want to say embraced it exactly, but they've really accepted that it's, you know, that it, it, uh, it has, it comes with moral obligation that, you know, we have to shoulder as the, you know, as the inflictors of roadkill. Yeah, I thought that was a really heartrending chapter. And it just made me wonder, I mean, are there some lessons there to be learned from the way that they view like their moral obligation that that could be translated to the United States, for example? Is there obviously I think there's room for us to grow on that in that regard, um, but how could how could that culture of caring be transplanted? 
Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question, Mike. I mean, I I think that look, I mean, one of the things about about that culture of caring is that it's you know it's certainly heartwarming and admirable, and I'm you know I'm I'm kind of in awe of the people who do it. But it's also a really imperfect solution, right? I mean, obviously, you know, those animals are still dying, and if you you know if you raise a wombat to adulthood and then release it back into the roadkill capital of the world, you know, it's it's still in a lot of trouble, right? Uh, so. You know, I, I admire the the cares, but you know, it would be even better to create a world where they didn't have to exist, right? Where we built, you know, enough wildlife crossings and fences that we actually made a difference, uh, you know, at, with the problem, and and you know, and, and prevented some of those animals from from having to come into care in the first place. And you know, I, I think that's really, you know, the lesson to learn for you know, from from my standpoint is, you know, if, if we want to show empathy and compassion uh, and love to other beings, well, the way to do that is to design roads that don't kill them in the first place, right? And, you know, and I, I think I said earlier that, you know, that that I found that wildlife crossing on Highway 93 that I got up on the top of to be this kind of amazing expression of ecological empathy. And, you know, I think that's really what, you know, animal friendly design is. It's a way of, you know, showing care and concern for, for wildlife. Right. And, um, that sort of leads into what was my favorite chapter in the book, which is the last one where you examine the entire like design of infrastructure in urban areas, which, you know, which then spreads out into, you know, the rest of the, the country. And you, you outline in the book that it's likely that we're going to keep building more roads and, and adding more suburban sprawl. Um, but there was a very, you know, pronounced period of American history where there was a targeted, you know, obliteration of neighborhoods using highways. And so can you just go ahead and briefly explain the importance of walkability, dense urban neighborhoods where, where people don't have to rely on cars to live? Yeah, yeah, it's it's I mean it's that's it's so important. You know, the kind of that shameful era of history you're talking about, you know, is really in the 1950s and 60s, you know, as as the you know, the big interstate highways are are coming online, you know, there were lots of white urban planners in cities like Minneapolis and Miami and Syracuse who basically said, you know, hey, there are these, you know, these these black neighborhoods that we want to essentially displace or even, you know, extinguish all altogether. And, you know, these, I mean, these communities of color were incredibly vibrant, you know, social and economic places. And, and, uh, but because, you know, they, they were uh, occupied by non-white people, you know, many urban planners basically considered them, you know, symbols of blight or slums and, and, you know, and, and really deliberately routed the, these new urban freeways through those neighborhoods to, you know, again, dis displace or, or destroy them. And, you know, and those, those sort of racist urban freeways have huge legacies today. You know, the people who live near them still, you know, suffer disproportionately from the air pollution and the noise pollution and the kind of the fragmentation of their neighborhoods uh, that results from those, those freeways. So, you know, it's, it's imperative that we, you know, kind of redesign uh, our cities when, you know, when, when we're able to, 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 mitigate those impacts you know and in, in Syracuse where I, I visited working on that chapter you know they're they're in the very gradual slow process of beginning to uh, you know design how they're going to tear down this giant viaduct that runs I-81 right through the middle of Syracuse and you know really destroyed uh, you know a historic black neighborhood there you know they're they're starting the process uh, for tearing down that that racist structure and, you know, replacing it with kind of a street level boulevard that will, you know, hopefully be lined with houses and small businesses and, you know, kind of recreate that vibrant neighborhood that used to exist. And, you know, I think that that goes to show that, you know, as, as, as permanent as these, these roadways seem, you know, we, we are capable of unmaking some of them, you know, we, we, we really can undo some of the most egregious damage that we've inflicted. Right. And, and so that, that was kind of like where it, it, it kind of, you know, it circled it all around for me. And I thought, obviously it can be done. Um, and, you know, in, in, there's some nuance there in regards to like fears of gentrification that you go into a little bit, but there's massive opportunity here uh, to, to sort of, to, to re to redesign the cities we have, or, you know, rebuild that walkability that we lost to get people out of their, out of their cars. I, I don't know the exact statistic, but there is a, uh, there was a study done that found what percentage 
of trips in a car are over three miles. And it was mm. some astronomically small amount. Like most trips in a car are are done in, in the United States in three mile increments. Like, you know, arguably things that could be done with public transit or on a bike um, or sometimes just simply walking. A little fact check on my statement here for our listeners. The study that I mentioned was done by the Maryland Transportation Institute for the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. It was actually on daily trips for all modes of transportation, not just cars, taken in the United States in 2021. The study found 52% of all trips were less than three miles, and almost 30% of all trips were less than a single mile. And only 2% of all trips were greater than 50 miles. And so do you think there is some potential here to significantly decrease the impact that roads have on our wildlife and our ecology by redesigning cities? Yeah, you know, it's 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 a it's an interesting question and, and you know, one that I've, I've certainly thought about. I mean, I, I look, I, I think that absolutely redesigning cities to become more walkable or to have you know better transit options is is absolutely imperative for so many reasons for our, our own health and safety and flourishing you know for the climate uh for a, a million reasons you know we we want denser more walkable more bikeable cities with better you know with better bus and uh, and and subway options um you know but but whether that will help wildlife or how that will impact wildlife is is a it's a it's a it's a difficult problem to kind of wrap my head around. I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I think one of the challenges is that road ecology problems are, are disproportionately concentrated in more rural areas. You know, I, I live in kind of rural central Colorado. Uh, and, you know, this is where, you know, we've got big herds of mule deer and elk and, and antelope. You know, we have these kind of abundant wildlife populations because we're, you know, a, a less developed corner of the American West. Uh, and we're also a really car dominated corner of the American West, right? Because it's, you know, it's sort of so, I mean, you know, in these kind of large laid out rural areas, you know, it's, 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 uh, you kind of have to get around via car. Uh, and it's, you know, it's sort of hard to imagine the, you know, the bus or train system that is going to, you know, liberate, you know, southwestern Wyoming from, from uh, automobiles, you know, so I, I think that's the, that's the challenge is that, look, I mean, less driving is, imperative for so many reasons. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I, I do wonder whether creating more walkable, denser cities is, is going to, you know, benefit benefit wildlife in, in uh, the rural areas where it tends to be concentrated. Right. I, I suppose the other thing which you, you touch upon in the book is sort of the, the increase in, uh, or at least the shifting nature of how we transport goods, which you sort of highlight increasingly is looking to be automated, um, such as automated trucks. Um, and that's another factor to deal with. Automated systems haven't exactly perfected the art of detecting wildlife on roads. I mean, if you look at San Francisco, that, you know, Waymo and, and Google clearly has some issues. You know, things are not going going so well over there, I would assertively argue in terms of how, <laughs> how, uh, how driverless cars are being implemented. Just for some context for listeners, in an article published to Forbes on the 21st of August 2023, it states that between July of 2021 and 2023, Waymo reported 150 crashes to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And in May of this year, a Waymo vehicle killed a small dog in San Francisco while in autonomous driving mode with a human being in the front seat. Um, so... What's what's the what's the problem here that we're looking at? Yeah, it's you know it's a, it's a great question, and you know I think I mean when it when it comes to how AVs will impact nature, I mean I think the answer is we don't we don't ultimately know. You know, I I, I might be a little bit more optimistic than you about about the you know the future of that that technology. I mean it's I mean certainly it's true that it's you know it's it's buggy as heck right now, and and uh, you know and and. Um, you know, hugely dangerous and problematic. But, you know, look, human drivers are also hugely dangerous and problematic, and we're not very good at uh, detecting and avoiding pedestrians and wild animals either. That's, that's um, true. So, you know, so, so you know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I do I do tend to think that, you know, that over time, of course, that, you know, a, AVs will improve. And, you know, I, I think that they're only going to become a, a more prominent part of our of our, our vehicle portfolio. And, and uh, you know, how that will affect nature.
future is a, a giant question mark. I mean, I, you know, I do think that ultimately they'll they'll probably be better than we are at, at detecting and avoiding, you know, big animals like deer and uh, elk. But, you know, that's not going to help, uh, you know, a, a ground squirrel or a rattlesnake. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, the bigger problem is that they're probably they're probably going to encourage more driving and more sprawl. Right. You know, when you can get in your automated vehicle uh, and, you know, work on your laptop or watch a movie or whatever, you know, your your commute becomes less onerous. And, you know, and, and I think it's likely that people will be incentivized to move further away from urban centers and drive further uh, in their in their AVs. I mean, basically every you know every modeling study that's been done about autonomous vehicles suggests that they're going to lead to you know more uh, vehicle miles traveled on on our, our roadways, and obviously that's not good for for wildlife at all. So you know it's it's uh, yeah it's a, it's a sort of a, a giant unknown, but it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the uh, the decades to come. Right. Yeah. I'm just sort of. I'm sort of cringing at all the amount, the amount of concrete that's going to be added from the increase of that sprawl. Um, because like that, that impacts things such as, you know, like increases, you know, flood risk and further, you know, increases the amount of pollutants that are going into soils and things like that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a big, it's a big problem. Um, I could continue talking about this subject all day. This is a, this is a great book. Highly recommend, highly recommend people read this book. Um, where, where can people go to find more information on it and all the work that you're doing? Yeah, they can check out my, my website, which is just uh, bengoldfarb.com. And on Twitter, I'm, I'm uh, Ben A. Goldfarb. And uh, yeah, I, I, I so enjoyed this conversation, Mike. Thanks a lot for the uh, the excellent questions. And I'm, I'm also just really appreciative um, of Manga Bay's coverage of this issue over the years. You know, I, I really drew on, on your guys' reporting uh, as I wrote this book. And, you know, I know that there are a number of Manga Bay stories uh, cited in the uh, in the end notes. And uh, I, I'm really grateful for all you guys have done to shine a, a light on this issue. So, so thank you so much. All right, Ben. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Mike. Appreciate it. If you want to check out Crossings by Ben Goldfarb, I encourage you to do so by clicking the link in the show notes here or in the article to this podcast. And as always, if you enjoy the Manga Bay newscast and you want to help us out, please spread the word by telling a friend about our show because that is the best way to help expand our reach and keep growing. But if you want, you can also support us by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news outlet, so even just a dollar per month does help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, head to patreon.com forward slash manga bay to learn more and support the manga bay newscast. You and your friends can also join the listeners who have downloaded the Manga Bay newscast over half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcast from, or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows in all of our previous episodes. And, of course, you can always read our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to check us out on social media, find Manga Bay on most of the social platforms out there, including LinkedIn, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Facebook, and TikTok, with our handle at Manga Bay, and also on YouTube at Manga Bay TV. Thanks as always for listening. <laughs>